Guys, I welcome you to part three of this series right now, Light in the Darkness. It's been an absolute great kickoff the last two weeks. Awesome, awesome messages, great communicators. Uh, and it's my privilege to share with you today. Uh, my name is Joff. I get to be the campus pastor here uh, with my wife, Sean, in Hereford with a wonderful set of people. And um, we're going to go on a journey today. I've got a message for you. Um, I didn't have much until late last night. Uh, all I knew was uh, which person I was going to talk about and then that I wanted a big chain, right? And so I, I literally asked someone, uh, I asked Rosie this week, could you deliver a chain for me? Uh, and she messaged, she had two options, um, and I said, the biggest, rustiest chain wins. I feel like the goods have been delivered. This is a big old rusty chain. Well done to Ian Haskell for lifting it in place. It's been amazing. But I love usually to try and get a little giggle out of you. I love usually to get a little chuckle out of you. Break the ice. You know, if you're new, you might not know what church is all about, and you just want to feel a bit comfortable. I love doing that. However, today... I might not make you as comfortable because the first thing I want to do is actually go straight into a piece of scripture that we're going to be using today, the story that we're going to be using. Um, but before we do that, I'd love for us just to pray, okay? Because I truly believe that ultimately I can say a bunch of words on this stage, but God wants to do something more, okay? So if you want to pray with me, just stand with me. We're going to pray together and then we're going to go into it. Father, I thank you, God, that you are present around the world, God, right now, whoever's listening to this message, even if you're listening weeks or months beyond this point that has been recorded, God's got you there for a specific reason. He wants to speak to you, and right now, to every soul listening, I pray, God, would you reveal more of your heart, more of your love, more of who you are, Lord, and who we are to you, God. I pray, Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So let's go to this piece of scripture. It's in Mark 5. So we'll start there. Mark 5 verse 1. It says this, they came to the other side of the sea, they being Jesus and the disciples, to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And the man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with chains. Ah, see, chains. For he had often been bound with shackles for the feet and with chains, and he tore apart the chains and broke the shackles into pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue and tame him. Night and day, he was constantly screaming and shrieking among the tombs and on the mountains and cutting himself with sharp stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him in homage. Welcome to church this morning. There's some light reading for you. Eh? So if you're asking yourself, where the heck are we going? What is going on here? If you're not used to this scripture, if you've never read it, uh, it's quite intense. And I'm very aware that even some of the things that we might be covering today might be slightly uh, sensitive stuff. But just know God's heart for you. Okay? If there's been stuff that you've been struggling with, please hear what God has to say about your life. So for those who, who don't know the Bible very well, we're in the New Testament here. I'll just bring a little bit of context. Just flesh this out a little bit um, so you know where we're at. Because Jesus at this point is still quite early on in his ministry. He's picked his disciples. And do you know what? They're living the life right now, right? These guys, especially from a disciple's perspective, they can see Jesus teach. Like he's literally asked them, come follow me. So they made the decision. Give up their lives. Follow this man. This is a great teacher apparently. Hey, let's see what happens. And they follow him and get to experience the incredible thing it is, the adventure it is to follow Jesus. So they see him turn water into wine. Amen. Amazing. They see him heal people, loads of sicknesses, diseases, done. And then he sees them, they see them, him preaching, teaching to small groups of people, large masses. These guys are loving it. They're lapping it up. They're like, we want more of this. This is what I signed up to. Like, this is the life. Like, we're blessed, brothers. Like, this is awesome, right? And then we've got in Mark 4, if we go one chapter earlier, you'll find that Jesus was literally speaking to the masses, so much so that there are so many people on the shoreline, he actually had to be in a boat, a little bit out in the water, because there was no space. Everyone was coming to hear from him. He was sharing stories, parables. People were loving it. And then he's got this uh, intimate moments with his uh, disciples where he explains things a bit more in depth. So these guys are living the life. And at the end of that day, they're asking, okay, Jesus, that was amazing. All these people, see them respond, see them uh, get emotional, all that, like something was happening. We loved it. Where to next? 
And then we see Jesus respond to that question. And basically, in Mark 4, verse 35, he says, you know what? Right now, it's time to go over to the other side. And he's pointing towards the Sea of Galilee. So on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, he's like, that's where we're going. These guys were like, that's awesome. What are we going to do over there? He's like, you'll see. All right. And so these guys are excited. They're passionate. They're full of life. They're full of adrenaline. They're processing the day. They're in the boat. And then something happens. And so when you go to verse 36, here's what happens. So leaving the crowd, they took him with them. Uh, they took him with them. So Jesus, just as he was in the boat, and other boats were with him. And a fierce windstorm began to blow. And waves were breaking over the boat so that it was already being swamped. But Jesus was in the stern asleep, crazy, through the storm. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're about to die? So slightly dramatic. Now, if you're just reading that on a page, you got to kind of imagine it. So I thought, let's give us a little bit of an experience of what it must have been like. So we'll do that right now. So obviously, these guys have just come into the boat. They've had an amazing day. And then the storm hits. Someone was very shocked there. It is loud. The wind is deafening. I don't know if you can hear me, but that's good. That's like it's supposed to be. And so these waves are crashing into the boat. The boat goes left to right, up and down. It is insane. They're disoriented. The waves crash into the boat. They're now getting soaked. Peter's getting water all splashed in his face. It's insane. They're screaming, Jesus, help us. We don't know what to do. Where's Jesus? One of them spots him in the back of the boat. Tries to wake up. He's like, Jesus, what are you doing asleep? Don't you care that we're about to die? Jesus calmly, calmly stands up, rolls his eyes. He's like, all right, watch this. He walks to the front of the boat. And he's like, shush! Bang. Hey. I don't know if you caught all of that, but I am out of breath. Okay? But he literally, he just walks up to the front of the boat. And with a stern voice, he's like, shush now. Like, die down. And this storm, in an instant, just silenced. Now, can you imagine being one of the disciples in the boat? You're literally soaking, dripping with seawater. You're there shaking from the adrenaline. You thought you were going to lose your life. You have no clue why Jesus was sleeping. You're slightly upset and angry at him. And then you see him do this, and you're like, what the heck just happened? Right? This man, they're looking at each other, the disciples, and they're like, did you just see that? I, I think I did. Did he just speak to the wind? I think he did. Did the wind just listen to him? I think it did. They're absolutely gobsmacked. They're trying to process this. Jesus is like, yo, uh, I'm going back to sleep. Wake me up when we get there. All right? And so you won't find this in the Bible. This is my imagination. <laughs> But I think you got to do this. When you read scripture, you can't just read it. you got to picture how things were. Because these were real humans, real people with real emotions, real experiences. <sighs> I'm so out of breath. <laughs> and so these guys are sitting there in the boat. I imagine at this point, just quietly, just grateful to be alive. Jesus is snoring, maybe. Isn't that cool? Jesus could be snoring. That's amazing. And so all of a sudden, it's like they hit ground. Right, Jesus wakes up, they're there, they jump out of the boat, screaming from excitement because they've never been so happy to see sand, to see solid ground. You got Peter just like rolling in it, rubbing his face in it. It's like solid ground. Even though I'm a fisherman, I want to be here right now, not out there. Right? His face full of sand, he's rubbing it off, and he's like, oh, we made it. Looking at each other, being like, man, that was awesome, but that was crazy. I hope that was a one-time deal. Now, read the Gospels. It was not a one-time deal. Jesus did many things to scare them um, and teach them something through it. But at this point now, they're all out on the boat, out of the boat, onto the shore. In my mind, because this was nighttime, I think this is still nighttime or either like early in the morning, like dawn. You just have some light just breaking through over the horizon. But you can't really see much yet. You can maybe see the, 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 the hills or make out some people who are close to you, but otherwise it's quite dark still. 
and you got Jesus coming out, just casually walking like nothing happened, just standing amongst them and just looking straight ahead. Right? And these guys are still finding their bearings. They're like, are we, where are we? Like, are we in the right place? And I imagine this isn't the destination they were aiming for. I imagine that the storm redirected them. Sometimes God will do that. He'll use something to redirect your life. And so at this point, they're just taking in the scenery, trying to figure out where they're at. This isn't what we're aiming for, but I guess this is okay. I guess this will do. And then they're looking at Jesus, and he's just staring, not saying anything. And they're like, Jesus, are we, are we in the right place? And he's like, we are exactly where we need to be. And so he's looking forwards. And at this point, the disciples can just hear this. This is for the online people. Hopefully you could hear that. <laughs> but in the distance, all they hear is a sound. Just this. And they're like, oh, what's that? And so they're looking at each other. They're like, did you hear that? I didn't. You did? I didn't. And then it becomes louder. And this thing's getting closer. And all they hear is these chains in the distance. They're like, is that? What? I can hear some rumbling. I can hear some growling even. What is that? Is that an animal? Is it come loose? Is it just dragging a chain along? And at this point, they're trying to figure out what's going on. Jesus is just looking calm as whatever. Um, he's just looking. And so they're like, all right, well, I guess this is all good. And all of a sudden, they spot in the distance this obscure figure just looking straight at them. They can't make out, is this a big animal? Is that a bear? Is that a human? I don't know, but it's not making nice sounds. I don't like this. This is bad juju. Jesus, can we get back in the boat, please? Jesus is like, shush, please, just watch. Okay, and these guys are just looking at each other. And all of a sudden, because this is what it says in Mark 5, verse 6, it says, seeing Jesus from a distance, this man standing there, he ran up and bowed down before him in homage. So at one point, he's not just standing there. Now this man is charging at them. These guys are like, whoa, I don't know what's going on. All they can hear is these chains rattling, the feet stomping in the dirt, the growling. And they're like, is this even a human being? This man, and if you read Luke, has not got any clothes on either. So they're like, ooh, hello. Right? <laughs> And so these guys are shocked. And this man runs straight to Jesus. Jesus doesn't flinch. He just stands there, looks at him. This man comes and bows before him. They're like, whoa, what is this? Can you imagine some of the anxiety? Some of the like adrenaline of what is going to happen? Jesus is like, just watch. Because this is exactly where Jesus wanted to be. He left the masses to come and meet this one man. He came through the storm to come and meet this one man. This man who had been there for a very long time. This man who had been in torment, in pain. This man who was uh, ousted by the people he grew up with. This man who was a reject. This man who had to live in the tombs. This man who was shrieking day and night because of what was going on. And so at this point, this man is there with leftover chains on his arms because the only time people came out looking for him was to see if he was still bound up. And if not, they would put more chains on him. And so this is quite an extreme scenario. But I want to ask you three questions through this story because I believe that there's certain patterns and certain things within this story that can apply to our own lives. And so with this man, as he was chained down, I want to ask you, what chains have been put on you in your life? Because I'll tell you what, there are circumstances, there's things that happen in your life where it is going to want to bind you up. There's other people that want to put chains on you. There's things that happen that want to weigh you down. No child grows up wanting to go on a dark path. No child at seven, six, you know, eight years old things, I'm going to go in the most dark place when I grow up. I want to go and enjoy all the disgusting things and live the worst life ever. I want to be bound up in chains. No child wants that, but life happens. Sometimes life happens to you. Sometimes you make decisions and chains come and take over your life and you're restrained and you're stuck. So what are these chains? What chains have been put on your life? Is it chains of 
uh, shame? Is it chains of failure? Is it things that even as you've tried with your own strength to break free, because this man here broke free a bunch of times. He had the strength to break free from these chains. However, there was always a little bit left over hanging on him. So with every step he took, he would just always hear. And with every step that he took to try and break free from these chains, he would be reminded by the sound of who he was at this point. That people would see him as a failure. That people would want nothing to do with him. That people would rather see him bound up, out there, naked, than try and help him out. Because they had no more plans. They had no more ideas of how to help this guy out. And so maybe there's even chains that you tried to break free from. Maybe there's things that you tried to break free from, but there's a sound that just reminds you every single time of who you were of what you did, of what you're carrying, of what you're not free from, what's still trying to pull you back. And maybe even that chain was a little chain to start with, but over time it's become this big bulky chain that you don't know how to come loose from anymore. And you just don't know. So what has chained you up? And then what it also says about this man is not only did people come and try and put him in chains, But he himself would punish himself. He himself would cut himself with stones. He would cut his skin. And every time he would, he would mark himself with, I'm not good enough. He would mark himself with, I'm not worthy. He would mark himself with, I'm disgusting. He had low self-esteem. He took on the lies of others. He took on what he's done maybe, because this is the thing, we don't know what he did to end up in this place. We don't know if this was a process over time that just got worse or just one event that just made him go this way. However, whatever it was, he was just punishing himself, saying, I can't do it. I'm never gonna be good enough. These people, they just hate me. And this, this, this self-esteem issue made him mark himself. And so my second question that I want to ask us is, maybe no one's putting chains on you, but maybe you're marking yourself. Maybe you're marking yourself with something because you've taken on an identity that actually isn't yours. But you're saying, Do you know what? No, I'm just insecure. No, I'll just never be good at that. Do you know what? No one's ever going to love me. Do you know what? I'll never find that right person for me. Do you know what? Relationship after relationship, I'll just always be abused. And you just mark yourself. I'm just that kind of person. And see, and this is, this is the way the villagers around him saw him. They saw him as this madman with marks. They saw him as the man that should be put in chains. But I believe that because he cut himself, he would see himself that way as well. So he's punishing himself. But then this day, something changes. This day, someone's coming out to look for him. This time, not to put him into more bondage. This time, it's the light of the world that wants to come and set him free. And so this day, he has this interaction, and he runs up to Jesus, and he comes and bows before him, and they have this interaction. And so this is what we read in Mark 5, verse 7. It goes like this, and screaming with a loud voice. So this guy is literally at Jesus' feet, screaming with a loud voice. He said, what business do we have in common with each other, Jesus, son of the most high God? Now, this is not what I expected. But he says, I implore you by God, swear to me, do not torment me. For Jesus had been saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. He was asking him, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And what I found interesting about this bit is that although this man was talking to Jesus, it wasn't actually the man talking. Although his voice was making noises and words, it wasn't the man who was communicating. It was something else. And Jesus knows And Jesus is like, what is your name? And so the question I want to ask you is, what voices have we allowed to talk for ourselves? What voices have we allowed to speak for us? Is it that voice of insecurity? Because God didn't make you to be insecure. Yet it's the voice of insecurity that often leads. 
It's the voice of fear sometimes that speaks rather than the confidence and trust that you can have in God that wants to lead. What voice is it that is taking dominion over your life? Is it the voice of bitterness? Is it the voice of rejection? Is it the, the voice of self-loathing? Is it the voice of always wanting to strive because you just, you're just not good enough? It's just, uh, if I can only get there, then I'll prove to them. What voice is speaking in your life? And for some of us, this can be quite a big issue. And I know we've gone through many pastoral situations. You've got many people, you'll hear them talk, and you know that's not really you talking. What made you end up talking like this? What is it that changed? And Jesus wants to come in, and like Romans 12, 2 says, he wants to renew your mind. He wants to almost press reset and remind you of who you truly are. Because he, when he looks at this man, see, everyone was looking at this man as this crazy madman, absolutely insane, you know, cutting himself, all that. Jesus sees the person he created, the purpose and the potential within him. That's what he sees. So when he sees you and you speak out of fear, you speak out of insecurity, you speak out of bitterness, he hears it, but he sees you and he's like, that's not you. That's not who I've created you to be. You're not that person. Some people are not what they say. And there's, you can, I'm sure I'm not the only one. I hope I'm not, otherwise I'm going to expose myself. Um, but I'm sure that's happened before where you'll walk down the street and there's just maybe someone very obnoxious making a lot of noise or some teenagers being very, you know, over the top. And you know that it's because they're in a group. If they walk by themselves, they'd be very humble. They wouldn't look you in the eye, wouldn't say much. And you just get a little bit annoyed. You get frustrated because you're looking at the outside appearance. You're looking at the outside expression and it just rubs you up the wrong way. That's how people looked at this man that identifies as legion because we are many things. What many things do you think have been put on you that Jesus never put on you? He sees you for who you truly are. What's my next scripture? There we go. Because this man, at that point, when he saw Jesus in the distance, he could have made a decision. I can either run into the hills and stay where I'm familiar. I've been here for a long time. Hey, I've gotten used to these shackles. I can deal with this. I'm not enjoying it, but I don't think he's coming for good things. My experience with people is if they come to me, I need to run away. He could have done that, yet he saw something in Jesus. He saw the light of the world. He saw something where he was like, you're safe. You're good. I need to run to you. So he runs to him. And Jesus then comes into his life and wants to be the light. And so Jesus sets him free. You can read the story. It's a quite a, a, a strange way of doing it. But ultimately, he sets this man free from the many demons that are within him. He sets him free. Because what he wants to do is he wants to show, I am the light. You have been living in darkness. Come into the light with me now. Because this is what John 1 verse 5 says. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Another translation says, it can't extinguish it. There's nothing the darkness can do to extinguish the goodness of God. There's nothing the darkness can do to extinguish the light that Jesus has for you. And so Jesus is trying to remind you of who you truly are. You're a light bearer. Because actually, he says, in Matthew 5, when he does the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you are the light of the world. You carry that light. I don't know if these disciples would have gone here if he would have told them. He just said, let's go to the other side. And then the storm potentially redirected them right to where he needed to be. I think they might have known what that place was. I mean, a story like that goes around. People gossip. And so if he would have told them, yeah, we're going to go to that guy that calls himself Legion, they would have been like, nah, -uh, I'm not going, Jesus. Yeah, I've heard stories. That guy can't even be bound up in chains. 
But Jesus is calling us as a church. He's calling us as his people to be light bearers and go to some of the dark places. Go to some of the people that you might have thought you're obnoxious and you're annoying me, you're rubbing me up the wrong way. But it's just a cry. It's just a shriek. It's just something that they are not because Jesus sees who they really are. And he's like, can you just see through my eyes? Can you just see the person I created? Can you just see the heart within them, the soul that is hurting? And so for us as a church, is, are we going to go to the other side? Are we going to go and find people who desperately need this light? How much longer did this man have before he cut himself too deep? How much longer did he have before he just gave up? Maybe the sounds he was making was literally a cry for help. And Jesus heard from the other side when he was with the masses. All these people coming to him. All these people praising him. All these people being like, wow, what an amazing teacher. Then he goes through the storm. And through this storm, when the storm is raging, he's there, he's thinking, I know what storm you're going through, but I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm going to do exactly what I'm going to do with this storm. I'm going to shush it. It's going to die down. So he gets to this man. He says, I'm, I'm here. And today I believe Jesus is here. But just like this man is, when you spot him, you now have to come to him because he's available. He's ready. He's ready to speak in to who you really are. We don't know this man's name, right? I'm not calling him Legion anymore because he's not. But Jesus knows his real name. Jesus knows your real name. He knows your heart. And the first time I ever brought this message, and it's also the last time I think I ever brought this message, it was years ago when Shani and I were still leading church in Bruges in Belgium. And literally, I felt that week I had to bring the story of Legion, which, you know, it's not a normal story you bring on a Sunday when you have VIPs coming in, people for the first time. It's a little bit intense, but I felt like there was something about it. So we brought the message, and that day, a lady came in for the very first time. She'd never been. We didn't know her, never heard about her. And I spotted her in the audience. I spotted her. And I was like, I've never seen that face. Great that you're here. And then after, she was very impacted. And after, in the cafe time, she came and she was like, who told you? I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. It's like, who set this up? Like, surely, surely someone told you about me. I'm like, I'm Joff. I, I don't know who you are. Like, Hi, welcome. I hope you enjoyed and she was explaining basically because she had had years and years of self-harm. And I kid you not, people, when we saw her arms, when she was wearing shorts and her legs and even her neck and other parts of her body that you wouldn't see because of clothes, you would struggle to find a place of untouched skin. You would struggle to find a place that wasn't scarred. This lady had hundreds upon thousands of lines drawn into her skin from the pain and the suffering she went through. She was scarred all over. And that day, we speak about this man who cut himself with stones. That day, Jesus was coming for her. That day, if it wasn't for anyone else, he's like, no, I'm coming to the other side. I'm here for you. And she felt so connected. And she ultimately, she responds to the gospel, gets saved, finds freedom, finds this God that actually loves and values her. And just like God came after Legion, God came after her. And I believe God's coming after you. Whatever your situation is, whatever your background is, whether it is this dramatic of a story, which I pray that it's not, because no one needs to go through that. However, whatever your story is, God is coming and saying, I'm here. I see you. I value you. I see the potential in your life, and I see the purpose that I designed you for. And so when he saw this man, it brought the scripture to mind in Isaiah 53 where it says, by his stripes we are healed. So when Jesus went to the cross and his skin was being flogged and literally ripped off his body, his stripes bleeding, I can imagine he was thinking of this man being like, I'm taking these stripes now. Maybe he was thinking of this woman in Bruges being like, I'm taking them. You're not even born yet, but I'm taking them. And he took our pain and he took our sin and he brought it all the way to the cross to pay for our sins to pay the ransom so that we didn't have to so that we could be set free 
He took on our stripes. He's the light. And he's coming in and he's saying, whatever chains are binding you, whatever voice is overpowering who you truly are, whatever mark you're putting on yourself, I'm bigger than that. I want more of you. And literally, we, we sang a song at the start, just before this message. It's called, As You Find Me. And it says, you love me as you find me. Jesus loved this man as he found him. You don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to act any differently to come to Jesus. You come. And this man, this is the thing. He couldn't speak for himself. So all he could do was come and drop at his feet. And the New King James says, in worship. It's one act of worship that set him free. You might not have the explanation. You might not have the words. You don't even know for the many things that you've done what to say sorry for. God, I'm just, I'm just here. I'm just coming at your feet. I'm just coming before you. I need to get loose from this darkness because I've seen the light in you. That's what I want. And he's like, you can have it. And so I want to ask everyone right now just to close your eyes. Because it starts with that. Maybe you've come in today and you've never seen Jesus that way. Maybe you've never accepted him. Maybe you've never walked with him. Maybe you've never invited him into your life. And then I would say that would be your first step. If you want to walk out of the dark into the light, if you want that light inside of you, then you've got to come to him. He's here right now. You've got to say, Jesus, I'm here. I want you. I'm sorry for what's happened in the past, but right now, I need some life change. Bring some light into this darkness. And I want you to be able to respond to that. But maybe you've done that before. Maybe you've walked with it, but you've walked away. You've gone on a detour. You've avoided him. And yet you know that everything you've focused on, everything you've chased, it does not fill the gap like Jesus does. And so I'm asking you, would you come back home today? And so I'm praying, if there's anyone here right now who either wants to come to Jesus for the first time or who wants to come back to him, that you would respond. And if that's for you, whilst people have their eyes closed, I'm just going to ask you to be brave, to lift your hand as a sign, that's for me. I want this Jesus in my life. I want to come back to him. Just lift your hand right now if that is for you. And I will pray for you. And we're going to pray for you. Is anyone here saying yes to Jesus right now? Lift it high so I can see it. Lift it high. Come on, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. And I pray that if there's anyone who feels bound up still, you might be walking with him. You might have a relationship with Jesus, yet... You feel like there's chains still hanging on. You feel like there's remnants of chains still hanging on. You feel like you have been marking yourself with things that aren't from God. Maybe there is a voice that is speaking for you. If you want to be set free from that, I want to pray for you. And so again, as people have their eyes closed, I believe the Holy Spirit is here and wants to do a work in your life. Or at least start a work in your life of setting you free. And so if that is for you, if you want to be set free from some of these things, I'm going to ask you, just lift your hand as well, and I'm going to pray for you. Is there anyone here? Amen. Is there anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Just lift your hand high so I can see it. Thank you. Come on. Is there anyone else? One last time. I'm going to ask, and we'll pray. Oh, Father, I thank you, God. I thank you that your presence is here. And where the light is, the darkness cannot overcome it, Father. And so I pray for whatever is chaining people, is binding them, Lord, whatever is speaking for them, whatever it is that is trying to hold them back right now, we pray for a breaking in the name of Jesus. We pray, Holy Spirit, for you to bring freedom right now, to set them free, Father, to renew the mind, Father. I pray, Holy Spirit, for your power to do what only you can do. 
too. Jesus, would you bless them? Would you favor them? Would you reveal more of your presence and your love and the value that you have and see within them, God? I pray, Lord, would you chase them down? Father, even tonight as they go and, and sleep, Father, that there'll be this fresh peace that transcends all understanding, God. We declare it over them right now and pray your name over them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.